Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are, and welcome to this webinar organized by Resilience First. I'm Robert Hall, the Executive Director of Resilience First. For those of you who were unable to view the opening video, our mission is to help build resilience across business communities. Uh, it doesn't matter whether those communities are defined by, by geography or special interest. I'm delighted that today we can introduce as our first webinar for 2021, uh, this session on the theme of the all important topic of the environment and the green recovery, but alongside the ever present COVID crisis we're all facing. With the Prime Minister announcing his 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution at the end of last year and COP26 being hosted by the UK later this year, then I expect the topic of a green recovery will gain adding additional momentum in 2021 uh, alongside the vaccines. And uh, so it's appropriate we start our calendar with this subject. Another powerful injection to the green debate uh, was given by the former governor of the Bank of England, Dr. Mark Carney, and now the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action Finance, who gave the BBC's Wreath Lecture just before Christmas. The last of his four talks, titled From Climate Crisis to Real Prosperity, is well worth listening to, and perhaps a better introduction to this topic than I could possibly offer. Uh, Dr. Carney said it was important to recognize that net zero wasn't a slogan, but an imperative for us all. I'm sure that our speaker today, the Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environment at Greater London Authority, uh, will echo the former governor and inject further meaning for us today from the London perspective. London has been ambitious in plans to tackle climate change, reach net zero and double the size of London's green economy by 2030. And I'm sure we'll hear more from Shirley on the London plan and the Green New Deal. Chair today's session, I'm very pleased to introduce Seth Schultz, who's the executive director of the Resilience Shift. Uh, in a minute, I will invite Seth to introduce Shirley, who will give our keynote address before we move to a fireside chat, albeit without the fire, uh, if only as a green initiative. Um, after the discussion, uh, there will be a Q&A. Uh, but I encourage all of those listening to ask questions of Shirley throughout the session by posting, hopefully brief, questions in the chat box to the right of your screen. I'm sure the chair will pick as many as he can in the Q&A session towards the end of the hour. So, Seth, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Really appreciate uh, the introduction. Um, and also thanks to, to Resilience First for hosting this conversation. I love the format of a, of a fireside chat, even though I'm, I'm, I'm joining you from, uh, from the East Coast in the U.S. here. So not quite a time for a fire, not quite, quite in the evening yet. But uh, I think the idea is fantastic. And I love the topic, um, particularly to kick off this new year. Um, so thanks for all of you who are joining us today. Um, really excited to have Shirley Rodriguez uh, here. I was delighted when I got the invitation to chair this conversation because Shirley and I have had an opportunity to work together for the last decade, in fact. Um, and I, I, won't, um, I won't give you the impressive kind of overview and record of what Shirley is working on now. Hopefully you might've seen that in the bio that she circulated. I wanna share a little bit of uh, be an introduction of, of Shirley and I's experience together the last decade. Uh, I don't know if many of the participants today know that uh, Shirley actually had a huge role in helping championing, championing globally the role of cities in tackling climate change. Um, she had a role um, some time ago at the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, and, and I was working at the Clinton Foundation at the time, and we ended up working together and uh, helped create uh, the world's largest network of mega cities, the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, um, as an early process with which cities and mayors around the world can tackle and collaborate the power of collaboration uh, on climate change uh, at, at that point in the lack of really other mechanisms um, via funding, knowledge generation, et cetera, to do so. Um, it was a very exciting time. C40 is now a network of over uh, 100 cities around the world uh, and has grown, kind of helped promote mayors as environmental rock stars, uh, but also to help uh, everybody realize that we're all in this together. And oftentimes it's, it is cities 
uh, purview. You know, they, they, your Shirley's job is to take care of Londoners and the city of London. And oftentimes, uh, to the exception of looking at, at things outside of the boundaries and the borders of London. And I think the power of these of these networks have shown us that it's important for cities to communicate, coordinate, collaborate, uh, and that one one city does in one part of the world actually does directly affect another city in another part of the world. Uh, so fascinating to kind of have that be your background and experience, surely, working at this macro level of creating a movement, of creating a theory of change associated with the importance of cities, both locally and globally. Uh, and now you find yourselves on the opposite end of that spectrum, working in a one specific city, um, still a very large and very influential city. And in fact, I should mention that that London was uh, actually the creator city of C40 back with uh, uh, Ken Livingston was, when Ken was the mayor of London. Actually, they, along with the Clinton Foundation, uh, founded that organization that I referenced earlier. So a lot of history here in terms of leadership in the city of London. Um, and now, as, as Robert had just mentioned, um, London continuing to take some bold and aggressive steps in climate change. Now, all of a sudden, being coupled with a, a prime, the prime minister, um, indicating the the ten point plan in terms of climate, which from the last that I've read, surely I understand to be the most uh, aggressive decarbonization approach from uh, a developed country, um, if I have my facts straight. But really interesting context and setting to to discuss today, surely. Of course, in the backdrop of COVID and what's happening in terms of um, the economy, uh, health, uh, equity. Um, and then you've got this this ever present uh, crisis of the climate looming in the midst of it. So um, really looking forward to hearing a little bit from you, Shirley, about the, the global, the local, what you're doing to try to, to balance and manage these these issues, these crises uh, simultaneously. Um, and not just for for Londoners, but for more broadly for the UK. And I would also say not to not with any hyperbole, but also on behalf of the world, the UK is going to be the host of COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, for the UNFCCC uh, in a critical period where this is the ratcheting up process where all the national governments are supposed to increase their nationally determined contributions. And the UK government is the host of this critical year. So um, no pressure, surely. Um, but as usual, I'm sure it's going to you're, you're going to rise to the challenge. I'm delighted to, to hear uh, about what you're up to. So perhaps I think, surely I might turn the floor over to you to share kind of some thoughts with our listeners Um as we enter the new year, what you've been up to, what the city is doing, um, what your priorities are. Uh, I think we can have 15, 20 minutes for, for your kind of opening remarks from you. Um, and then as uh, I would I invite, as Robert did, the, the, the folks who are listening to, to start sharing any questions, because I think after your, after your opening remarks, surely we'll just jump into a conversation um, and start having a very free flowing and free ranging discussion. And I'd like to bring in as many contributions from the listeners as possible. So Shirley, thanks again for joining us. Absolutely delighted that you're here. Thank you for the taking the time amidst everything happening um, and uh, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Seth, and to Robert um, also for, for those kind introductions and for the invitation to, to join you today for, for the session. Um, and as, as we discussed, it's partly to highlight how the mayor is working to tackle the climate and nature emergency, but as part of supporting a fair and equitable and green recovery from the pandemic. Um, and I think I'm also interested to hear um, your thoughts um, uh, from, from today's session, really, about how we can work together on this key issue. Um, and, and I'll start with just saying the mayor has been really clear um, since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and uh, the terrible impact it's having on London and Londoners, that um, tackling the climate emergency and making progress on our goals to be a zero carbon city are absolutely compatible with the recovery from that pandemic. You'll have heard um, phrases like build back better, build back greener, green recovery, green new deal. And essentially all of these phrases are really just to say that um, we want London's recovery from the pandemic to lead to a cleaner and fairer, more equal city uh, with a renewed drive to tackle climate change and its impacts, the air pollution crisis, and also create good quality jobs. Um, and that's really something that we've been hearing from Londoners in the, in the polling that we and others have been doing, that they see this as an opportunity to reset um, and not just return um, to, to the way things work, but to really use this as an opportunity to create a better, better city and better lives. Um, we'd already, um, Sadiq had already set out a very ambitious vision for London's environment. Uh, we have a host of strategies and plans that we have in London that, that really embed environment um, and climate change at their heart. 
Um, and he sets some very ambitious targets around a city that has to be, uh, that needs to be zero carbon, a zero waste city, uh, the transport network to be a zero emission network. We want um, over half of London to be green and blue. And of course, we want to make sure that it is more resilient so that it's ready for whatever the future holds. But we do this against a, a background of huge challenges that we face in London. And this was even before the impacts of the pandemic. Um, we're home to almost nine million people. We're about, as I've said, um, half the city is, is green, but access to precious green space really varies. We've peaked our carbon emissions in London, but we still have more to do. Our consumption emissions uh, um, are three times those of cities in Africa or Southeast Asia. Um, and since Sadiq was elected over four years ago now, we've made really impressive, I think, dramatic cuts in air pollution. But we still have tens of thousands of people still living in areas of illegally polluted air. And we have uh, a building stock that produces a huge retrofitting challenge. We have some of the worst insulated homes in the UK. And we have over one in 10 people in London living in fuel poverty. And of course, since the pandemic, we've seen um, these inequalities uh, and challenges exacerbated. We have now more people claiming unemployment benefits in London for, you know, for a very long time, and in particular um, affecting people in disadvantaged communities and the young. Um, we're seeing a rush back to cars, highlighting the dangers of a car-based recovery. And um, we've seen that a recent report from the CBI found that if we were to meet um, clean air guidelines, uh, we would see a massive econ uh, economic benefit to the UK by avoiding working days lost to illness. So, you know, really highlighting the dangers of that car-based recovery and the challenges we face. So we need to put environment at the centre of London's recovery and really address head on those social and economic challenges presented by COVID-19 and encourage new investment in London, help businesses to see long term growth um, and really get uh, going the, the, the drive for providing decent, skilled and local jobs. Um, and also protecting um, and investing in our environment will also help our city's resilience to future shocks, improve the health of Londoners and, and help avoid those economic costs. And a key element of this is our zero carbon target, which is now for 2030. Um, the environment strategy um, had set a, a 2050 target when Sadiq was first elected, um, but that has been changed to 2030 to really recognise um, the, the science and, and the, the critical nature of the challenge we face, the, the, the planet faces. Um, and some may and have said that it's not achievable, but Sadiq and others have been really clear that we can't afford not to try. And we're seeing every day many cities, businesses, individuals really agreeing with us and also taking up this target. So, so how are we doing this in terms of the recovery from the pandemic and really taking to heart those, those, um, that, that zero carbon target? Well, what we're doing is working very closely with London's boroughs, businesses and the community sector. And we've established a recovery board to support uh, London's recovery from the pandemic. And that board is co-chaired by the mayor and by uh, the chair of London councils, uh, which is the representative body for the London local authorities. And it also includes a number of stakeholders from across the city, including business representatives. Um, that board, uh, working together, has developed nine missions focusing on a variety of issues, from revitalising our high streets to improving digital access for Londoners. And environment is a really key cross-cutting principle through those nine missions. And the mission that I'm um, sort of uh, leading on is how do we develop and deliver a Green New Deal for London? And that objective is to tackle the climate and ecological emergencies and improve air quality by doubling the size of London's green economy by 2030. And in this way, accelerate job creation for all. And the reason we've set that as an objective is because we know that a green recovery will strengthen our existing economy. Our, current, uh, our existing low carbon and environmental goods and services sector is worth um, about 48 billion pounds worth uh, in sales and employs nearly 320,000 people and its annual growth rate pre-COVID was around 10%. And just to put this in context, it's worth more to the London economy than the construction and manufacturing sectors combined. So these environmental and energy policies are really important to create jobs in London. They're creating jobs 
to outside of London in the supply and value chains. Um, so, for example, the work that we're doing to electrify our bus network um, will create high skilled um, manufacturing jobs in the electric vehicle uh, industry in places outside of London, like Falkirk, Ballymena, Leeds. And this is really on the back of our work to, to ensure that London is zero carbon by 2030. So the, the, this particular mission, the Green New Deal mission, has three pillars um, designed to address the social and economic inequalities in our city, as well as the environmental um, challenges. And those three are um, working on the built environment. So how do we retrofit our buildings and infrastructure to make sure they're well adapted to future climate challenges, they're energy efficient, and they're supplied by uh, low and zero carbon energy sources. The second is around transport in the public realm. So this is this is sort of a focus on more walking and cycling, uh, the shift to public transport, electrification of our transport network, more infrastructure um, to support that, that electric vehicle um, move. Um, and that brings also uh, a focus also on more access to green space and a better, cleaner air. And the third Philip pillar is, is around what we call green foundation. So how do we help businesses in London um, with new skills programmes and training London is in the new jobs we need for that uh, shift to the green economy, um, such as modern methods of construction, retrofit, renewable energy and the circular economy. But it also means how do we find the finance to, to mobilise uh, those changes? Um, we've estimated in the one and a half degree plan that, that we developed for London um, that we're going to need something in the order of over £60 billion pounds worth to deliver on our plans to make London a zero carbon city. But the, the good news is we're not starting from scratch. We have a proven track record and uh, of delivering really positive environmental outcomes um, where we have the powers and we've been using them really effectively. So, so London um, is really well placed to showcase the leadership of what a green recovery would look like. And some recent examples for those of you uh, in London may, may, may have seen are our ultra low emission zone, uh, which has seen um, emissions, NOx emissions from road transport in our central uh, congestion charging area reduced by 44% um, and, and seen uh, some reductions in CO2 of around 6%. Um, and that has happened you know, very quickly and, and is a very dramatic change. Our Energy for Londoners programme has supported um, over 32,000 homes with new energy efficiency measures, saving 12,000 tonnes of carbon. We've been retrofitting public sector buildings um, and delivering uh, more solar panels. We've also been using our planning system for new build. Um, we're the only major city in the UK to have a zero carbon home standard. Um, and we're rolling that out now to non-domestic buildings as well. And this goes further than the current building regulations. And we've been seeing uh, you know, developers really step up and the new buildings are saving 40% more uh, carbon uh, emissions than they would have done uh, just by following building regulations, which is really impressive and really great leadership and testament to those developers who are really, who are really um, taking this to heart. And last year, um, uh, at the end of last year, the mayor announced the first £10 million pounds worth of our Green New Deal fund for seven projects across those three pillars around, for example, um, heat networks, a new district energy network in North London, where we've um, helped to um, supersize that network so it, it can be expanded to a couple more boroughs and, and provide um, low carbon heating to a number of housing uh, estates in North London. We're looking to electrify, start a bus garage electrification program to support the electrification of our bus fleet. We're looking to improve um, access to green space and make sure that um, those green spaces will really help um, support London's um, adaptation to climate change um, through um, sustainable urban drainage systems, for example. And we've provided funding to two new programmes or two programmes, existing programmes called Better Futures and Advanced London, which is really helping to support um, uh, BAME communities and, and women um, and entrepreneurs really in, to, to develop new and innovative um, sort of mechanisms to help support London's green recovery and the growth of our clean tech and circular businesses. And together, we think that's going to support around uh, a thousand new green jobs to boost London's economic recovery, but also tackling uh, the twin dangers of air pollution and the climate emergency. But I should say that um, 
that, that you know we've been doing this with London councils and, and as I said other stakeholders uh, around that table we've co-designed co the mission with London councils we've undertaken a consultative process with London stakeholders local leaders and community groups to really ensure that we have a broad base of support um, but we also know that we can't deliver on this without uh, people's help like businesses and the community groups and in fact all Londoners um, so this is a collective effort and, and Sadiq has been really clear that you know, we've really only got half uh, the, the powers to tackle half the emissions uh, in London. The other half, we need government help, but we also need everybody to step up and, and play their part. And some of the actions that we're working on now um, and we need your help with will be how do we unlock the finance we need? Um, we need much more public and private sector finance and an approach that that really tackles this sort of um, the risk return share um we are doing what we can through through our you know direct investment for our mayoral programs and um working with the green finance institute for example to consider how we might create a new financing facilities to really develop a, a sort of bankable um, pipeline of projects plus the finance that will go to them championing divestment you know working with our pension fund authority to really encourage systemic changes to, to investment policy um, by our institutional investors and, and recycle the money that they would have uh, put into fossil fuel um, companies into more sustainable uh, um, uh, finance mechanisms. Or we've been working with um, Transport for London on projects such as a new power purchase agreement for, to supply the, the tube with renewable energy and really grow uh, that, that supply of renewable energy capacity um, and we want to see that expanded so other organisations across London, whether it's the boroughs or, or other institutions, can be part of that. We're looking at a new electric vehicle strategy to really build on the work that we've been doing to really um, create the infrastructure in London. We have almost 300 rapid charging points installed over the last few years. We're a quarter of the UK's capacity, which is amazing. Um, but we need to do much more to really keep up um, that, 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 that ambition. And we also want to make sure that we support businesses to, to play their part. Businesses have shown incredible leadership and are absolutely key to powering London's recovery and getting London to be net zero. Um, we want to work even more closely to catalyze that transition. Um, and we need to hear, you know, what do you need to, 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 to be helped with that? We've been working with a number of leading uh, businesses in London, 10 international companies who are really driving their own environmental activities engaging with their supply chains and doing more than they 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 had said in their their original plans in in particular in what they could do in london so for example rolling out more um uh, more you know work on electric vehicles but for those businesses who aren't already taking action and and it's really critical that we do step up in this year of cop 26 um we want to understand what do you need to 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 be helped with we, we there are lots of things that we have tools for at the the gla that we've been working on um that, that we can help with accelerator programs that can help decarbonize your buildings um some of our um scrappage funds that have been helping to um remove the most polluting vehicles from fleets uh, and so on uh, work we have uh, developed a responsible procurement policy for example so lots of things there that we've been working on with many partners across London and internationally that 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 um, that we can share and we want to share and and in closing I just want to just to re-emphasize that um, a key part of our Green New Deal is how do we make sure that that net zero transition is fair and really addresses those inequalities in our society um, the pandemic has really exposed and exacerbated the, the existing inequalities facing Londoners and some of the most deprived boroughs in London, like Newham, have been really hardest hit by COVID-19. So as we rebuild our communities and our economy and the sort of social fabric uh, of London, um, we also want to make sure that the environmental challenges are also tackled and that we have prioritised those who need help the most. We've been doing some research to really understand um, what that transition to a low carbon circular economy represents to, to London's economy, which are the particular sectors that have been affected and the occupations. And we're going to be using that to really um, influence the development of our policy and programmes to support Londoners and businesses. And we're already starting to use some of this uh, research to um, feed into the, the, the shaping of the mayor's adult education budget and developing some um, 
new academies uh, around the sort of new skills that were going to be needed in London, like construction, uh, the modern methods of construction that I referred to earlier. So um, I think uh, I'm going to, to pause there. I, I hope you, this has given you a, a bit of a glimpse into the sort of challenges and opportunities that, that we're facing in London um, and that getting to net zero by 2030 really presents. Um, but the ambition we have to deliver that really fair and equitable and green recovery um, that, that, that we, you know, that we're really um, hoping to, to, to be really to press on with and, and keep that momentum up, despite the fact that, that we're, we're in lockdown again. Um, but as I said earlier, this is really only possible with the support of all Londoners, including the business community. And of course, I can't and, and shouldn't really let government get, get away without some mention. Um, the mayor uh, and businesses and many stakeholders in London are doing all we can to get to net zero. Many boroughs have declared climate emergencies. Many businesses have stepped up and set science-based targets. But we also need government to help and provide us with the resources and devolve the powers that we need to be able to make the step change in the rate of decarbonisation that we want to deliver. We're in a decade of action, um, as, as Robert and Seth have pointed out. You know, we're in, uh, we are the host country of COP26. London is the capital city of the host country. So we want to be able to show that leadership and we need to really uh, move fast on this. But we also need to make sure that in doing so, that we address those inequalities. Um, the the levelling up agenda isn't just outside of London. We have huge inequalities in London. So we need that levelling up to happen in London too. But if we get this right, and it's essential we do, um, our city, our communities and our economy will be cleaner, fairer and much more resilient than they were before. So thank you very much. Um, and I really look forward to having the chat with Seth and, and hearing um, from you and your questions as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shirley. Um, really appreciate that that overview. And it is as comprehensive and um, kind of awe-inspiring as I thought it would. Um, a little overwhelming um, but to have to juggle all of those things simultaneously, but also at speed and at scale. Um, and perhaps maybe, you know, that's the first thing I'd like to kind of circle back with you on is um, the work that you've outlined um, and the kind of um, bold and aggressive, but increasingly more common uh, targets that London had set for itself, uh, particularly I'm referring now in terms of your mid-century goal, now backing that down to a 2030 goal, which mm -hmm. I was delighted to see when it happened. It was a big deal um, and, and the continued champion and now seeing other cities, other actors, other companies come forward, but it, it's essential. I mean, if you want to try to solve this this equation, it is an equation in terms of time, emissions, costs, and economy, you can just backdate that. And it needs to happen this decade, as you've rightly said. Um, and yes, it's a daunting challenge, um, but humans are the most adaptable species on the planet. That's why we're the, at the top of that, that pyramid, um, so to speak, um, in terms of uh, biological beings. Um, and is that a, a, a adaptivity and creativity that I, I we, we I, you know, I am hopeful that we can accomplish this, but it is, it does require everyone. And I'm very curious, I guess, Shirley, the, the goal that you guys have set forth for 2030 in terms of uh, um, uh, zero carbon. Now that the, the government has come up with, a, I believe it is 68% reduction uh, by, by this decade, same time frame, by 1990 levels, making it the most aggressive one, as I had mentioned, in the world for a developed economy. It's still not carbon zero by... 2030. So what, if any, is the realignment of the work that you've been doing with your plan with the national government? So it, how is that aligned? Have you guys reassessed what that is, what the UK government set forth? You talked a lot about funding and the critical leadership the government needs to play. Absolutely agreed. But has there been a period where you've recalibrated what on the signals that they've sent and the funding and the alignment in the sectors to your plan and or provocatively the reverse? Have has the government picked up the work that the city of London has been doing and the strategy since you've been out ahead of this? And has that been recognized and sucked up into the national strategy? And then I also see the last kind of tie in on this for you. I see a question here from uh, Lord Toby Harris, uh, who's asking, does the mayor have the legal powers necessary to progress these initiatives or does he have to rely on the weight and mandate and profile? provide other bodies to take things forward. So a similar kind of three-part question. Have you done that analysis? Who's listening to who? And what is the authority of the mandate that the city currently has to do this? Oh, over to you, Shirley. I thought I'd start with a softball. <laughs> <laughs> and lots, lots of sub-questions. So let's start with the 
um, the the change, the, the, the government's recent announcement than the new target. Really, really welcome that. Um, although we'd say it's long overdue, and I think um, we have been leading the way in London. So we, we we believe that you know they've been following where we and many other cities, uh, whether it's in the UK or globally. Um, but also businesses, many other businesses have been taking that that sort of challenge on and setting those set science based targets. So, you know, we need to see that leadership, particularly in this year and particularly by the, the, the host country um, to really set that train of leadership across um, uh, across many other countries. And and so pleased to see that um, President elect Biden um, has been elected and, uh, you know, is committed to rejoin the Paris Agreement. And that's really going to send us a big signal. And I think that's already seen. You've seen that with with the, the, the announcements uh, that China and and, uh, and others, Japan and others have made. And we need much more of that momentum to to, to build up. In terms of what have we done in terms of that, the, the you know, looking at what the government said, we, we had already set a 2050 target anyway in 2018. Yeah. Sadiq has brought that forward to 2030 by saying we, we need this, you know, um, the IPCC has said this is the decade of action. We really have to get going. And you have seen, you know, it seems a very long time ago uh, when we were talking about the school strikes and the climate strikes and, and so on and citizens assemblies and Extinction Rebellion, um, you know, uh, discussions at the World Economic Forum, you know, a huge conversation about climate change. Um, that really had set us on this path. People were talking, you know, as I said, many boroughs in London had declared climate emergency. So you could set this new 2030 target. But but what we're absolutely clear is, you know, we don't want to spend another five years reanalyzing what the pathway is and doing more analysis. We know roughly what needs to happen and what needs to 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 be done and where it needs to be done and what the powers that we need to be devolved and the funding that needs to be provided to get there. We just need to do it quicker and we need to get on with it, which is why Sadiq is saying, you know, some may say that this is difficult, not achievable, but we've got to try. We can't afford not to try for, for our generation, but for future generations as well. So I don't think, you know, whilst we, you know, we will look at evidence and understanding and, and look at analyses, we're really just getting on with the broad programmes that we know need to happen, but um, pressing government to do much more. So um, we had published a few years ago um, on the back of that uh following the strategy, a, a pathway, a one and a half degree plan for London. Um, and this was part of our work with C40 and many other cities have done the same. And it's, it's now a requirement for membership of C40 and pretty much most of the cities have done so. And in the right COP, you'll see many more finalising their plans. And broadly, it's it's work around retrofitting our buildings, making sure new buildings are zero carbon standard, uh, making sure our, our transport networks are zero emission. And so on. So we know what needs to be done. Big challenges, though, are we we only have powers over half of the emissions uh, in London. The other half is really down to government action. And the bulk of that is making sure that our energy supplies decarbonized. Um, so we need government to carry on doing that. But the big challenges have been about the lack of um, clarity about heating for example, what is the heating strategy? And we're really pleased to see that now government have said, you know, on the back of advice from the Committee on Climate Change, they've got various consultations around heating strategies and they're talking through the um, the Green Industrial Revolution 10-point plan about some of the things that, that need to happen. From our point of view, that should have happened ages ago. We need to crack on and we need to crack on much faster. And, and more than anything, you need to give cities and businesses, the, the the sort of framework, the regulatory framework, and the powers and the resources to get on with it. So, so to Toby's point around, do we have all the legal powers um, to progress these initiatives? No, we don't. We really don't. Um, and we've been arguing for a long time around, uh, for example, you know, that the mayor should have the ability to set minimum energy efficiency standards. Um, you know, we wanted the government, and we're really pleased to see that to bring forward the um, the ban on the sale of new fossil fuel vehicles to 2030 and really pleased that they've, they've done that. Uh, we want to do more electric vehicles. Uh, you know, so all of these things, no, we don't have all the powers we want, but we have set out numerous times in, in various policy documents, um, the sorts of funding levels we need and the powers that, that we need um, uh, in London, including, you know, the fair share of funding for, for us to, to get on with our retrofitting programmes um, or speeding up, for example, the electrification of, uh, of our, our bus network in London. So um, so I think we've got a good sense of what we're doing. We just, just need to get on with it, I think. 
Yeah, I hear, I'm hearing that loud and clear, which is also, you know, kind of a reassuring message, right? We've known what we need to do. Um, these are, it's these broad brush strokes and we need to get on with it. Um, mm -hmm. So point that, you know, let's not paralysis through analysis and let's not regurgitate this and let's not come up with another plan. But at the same time, some of the comments did indicate that that is happening, right? There's been assessments, there's been frameworks, there's been an understanding of what you can and can't do. Um, so how is this going to, how are we going to do it differently, Shirley? How is this stuff going to get moved forward at a point when there is a lot of issues besides just climate change? And I think your opening remarks did a very good job, I, I believe, of laying out an argument of why equity, justice, economy, recovery, and climate go hand in hand. These are not separate things. So it's not as if you to do one and ignore the other, but in terms of the prioritization and how you implicate, in, 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 you know, do that together, it is, is challenging, it is difficult. Um, so what is it that you guys are doing now that you think is new or different in engaging that other 50% of authority or power that you do not have? Um, and in, I'm particularly interested as it pertains to COVID because I, I personally, would agree with you, Shirley, from the work that I do around the world, we saw an unbelievable response from the private sector around the world in terms of the actions that they took uh, during, uh, you, know, un, you know, unimaginable issues that we were dealing with in terms of COVID. And I, I begin seeing the, the leadership in terms of COVID and health uh, and the economy from pr the private sector even go more strongly over to the environmental side and the climate change issues. But I, so I guess that the, uh, kind of be more succinct to my question to you is how is or is is the city of London and its business community and other stakeholders aligned or not in accomplishing a 30, you know, a decade of 2030 plan associated with kind of backing that up more aggressively? Is it, are you seeing positive notes? Are you seeing overwhelming notes? Are you, where is the struggle? Where is the issue? And what can the listeners on this call from different kind of spectrums of that that, that non-state actor community, um, wh what should they be thinking about in terms of bringing their organizations to bear to collaborate with the city in, in order to get that private public uh, alignment? I think um, the, the change I've seen is is really the the, um, the recognition of how important how important collaboration is. So as you said on on the response to COVID, you know, the vaccine and how people have shared um experiences so that that people can learn from others um mistakes or 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 good practice you know which is sort of the ethos of the the c40 cities um network when when it was set up was really about that sort of not reinventing the wheel um but that is so important and and you know people talk about collaboration but really i think we've never seen so much collaboration as we have done around the 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 response to covid but also now the response to how we're going to to deal with London's recovery, and that is so important because it has helped, um, you know, bring people together around a common agenda. And you know, the, the development of those nine missions across, you know, L London's business community, NGOs, um, faith communities, universities, you know, uh, and so on, lo local authorities, is because people have identified these are these are sort of key areas that we really have to focus on, but recognizing that it's not siloed. You know that we have to have an environmental thread through it, uh, um, uh, and and you know to, uh, a fairness thread to this. So when we look at the development of the, those missions, each of them looks at you know how can we help tackle um, climate change, um, but also how do we reduce inequalities at the same time. Now there are there this is going to be difficult, but you know the fact that people are, are looking at it and trying to to um, square that circle is a start and you know we've already seen some good projects as I've said the mayor's put some term, you know 10 million of funding but we're looking the local authorities are looking at what they're doing and reorienting what they're doing so that all of our budgets are really focusing on London's recovery the GLA budget for example is now being framed around those nine missions what are we doing to help support London's recovery um, and we're not the only ones to do that C40 through um, under the chairmanship of the mayor of Milan Mayor Salah um, working with you know across across the piece has developed a, a sort of global green new deal and they've got about 10 key areas of activity um many of the things that we're doing in london around fairness and the economic recovery um but also you know anything from championing divestment through to what are we doing about retrofitting what are we doing about making our public realm um, more accessible safer 
cleaner, um, you know, more amenable to walking and cycling, but also making it more resilient um, to, to those future shocks that, that we, you know, that, that, that we're anticipating from, from just from climate impacts alone, let alone sort of future pandemics. So yeah. these are all things, it's the collaboration piece. And I think that recovery board is so important because we're actually, you know, so we have a, a meeting in a couple of days time. That's not been paused because the UK or London is in a fourth lockdown, um, you know, a, a national lockdown. It is carrying on because we see the importance of that collaboration and thinking about the recovery and making sure that we're tackling those economic and social challenges um, as we come out of this lockdown. I, yeah, I noted that in, in your remarks about that recovery board. I have not heard of that yet. Um, I found that fascinating, really interesting. I'd love to continue to to follow up with you on that to see how that emerges and evolves as a mm -hmm. mechanism for replication. Fantastic to hear that you do you do feel that there is more collaboration happening and occurring uh, and willingness, which is phenomenal. I wanted to pick up on something you just said, though. You mentioned the word resilience a few times, and it's fascinating that, you know, in in COVID, I think the 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 world has kind of reawoken to the issue of resilience, the fragility of our systems, the interconnected nature of them in a way that we have not before. Um, and that, uh, that awakening, that understanding of resilience is manifest as it pertains to COVID has manifested itself in different ways in terms of climate change. So, Cause it's not just about reducing our emissions. It's also becoming more resilient and, and, and adapting to a changing environment, a changing society. But one of the questions that I saw come, came through from one of our participants, um, I thought was quite interesting and, and been thinking about as well, surely, um, Esme was asking about out of the nine missions, the, the one that has to do with digital accessibility. I found that to be a really interesting question from Esme because the, the, the digital kind of infrastructure that is unseen and oftentimes unappreciated is to a large extent why we were all able around the world with those that were privileged to have access to digital infrastructure, why we could maintain any semblance of life and continue schools and work because what we're doing here, all digital. Um, and that also kind of fits in interestingly with the emphasis you keep putting on equity, accessibility. So you've got a lot of collaboration. It's still being done remotely. There's still lockdown. There's still haves and there have nots and education and capacity. And this digital currency, this access to content, we've got more content than we've ever had at our fingertips in terms of a human, the human species. But whether it's accessible or not, it is unbelievably critical now. And not just whether you have access to the Internet, but whether your company had that digital infrastructure, your government. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question from Esme that I wanted to flip back to you in terms of how does potentially that mission cross cut the others in terms of resilience, mitigation and climate? and equity, and what's the city doing about it? So I can't pretend I have all the answers, and we have um, Theo Blackwell, who's the chief digital officer um, at, at the GLA, who, who, who's a real wizard wizard all this. So, you know, I could certainly follow up with people if they want more information or, or connect you. But, you know, the reason why we, we've highlighted that as a key mission and why that was highlighted by the recovery board is precisely because of what you said, you know, we cannot function and uh, and it's amazing how people have stepped into this sort of new way of working and and uh, engaging with you know on a social level, let alone you know from a, from a work level or, or you know a business level. It's really critical. But you know what what is what is absolutely clear is that there are massive disparities about as as we said access, and that that's really the focus about how do we make sure that people have um, access to to the digital infrastructure. They need and it's not just just the infrastructure but you know just even the the you know um are they connected to the web you know we have a number of kids at school you know not just in london but across the country that don't even have a laptop don't have a um you know access to data uh, or just have one laptop in a household when you know they're, they're all having to share you know huge inequities how do we how do we resolve how do we resolve that so that that sort of um making that more accessible and fairer mm. is, is a key part of the work that, that Theo and that mission uh, and working with London local authorities and businesses and others uh, are looking at. And in terms of how, you know, that, that would help tackle the climate emergency. Well, uh, you know, that, that whole issue around, um, you know, the, the, the sort of interconnectedness of things, you know, the, the, the sort of smart nature, really reducing our call on energy, mm. um, um, the accessibility issue. These are all interconnected and, you know, I wouldn't pretend to know all the answers. And I think that's something that we're looking at and really trying to explore through that mission. 
Um, and anybody who's got any um, interesting thoughts about what we should be focusing on, I think, um, you know, we'd be really pleased to hear from them. Thanks, Shirley. Um, and another question I wanted to kind of, again, trying to get into a little bit more specificity after we've talked about the kind of the coordination, the collaboration, uh, the alignment, the goals, but into the details now. Um, one of the low carbon retrofit um, heating systems is, is green hydrogen. And mm -hmm. And a lot of focus are around the world in terms of hydrogen, uh, decarbonizing shipping uh, through hydrogen, et cetera. And this has come up in London uh, a number of times. Uh, but I believe this, the CEO of the UK's Climate Change Committee recently said that you would need 30 times more renewable energy to produce enough green hydrogen if it were to replace old gas boilers. So as an ex example, when we're talking about the scale of what needs to happen and not that I'm proposing that it all happens through um, green hydrogen, but the point is, when you start actually mapping out the solutions and what needs to happen in the time frame, you get to these things like 30 times more energy produced just to replace old gas boilers. Mm -hmm. So what's the solution in that? And how are you mapping out or thinking about applying technologies and solutions at, at, at multiple times uh, uh, concurrently? Because I think, I don't know about you, Shirley, but one of the things that often I run into is, you know, a decade ago, we used to be able to have a conversation about, oh, well, we'll transition off of fossil fuels and coal-fired to natural gas, and we'll go from natural gas to weaning ourselves off of nuclear, et cetera, et cetera. The, the reality is that we don't have the time to have that conversation anymore. You, we don't ha literally have the time or the carbon budget to do that. So how is how are you dealing with that in London in terms of looking at these solutions, what the implication of the scale is to decarbonize while at the same time the need for you to create more electricity, we're electrifying more and more things, is simultaneously occurring. How do you guys, how are you guys managing that energy transition in London while dependent so, to such a degree on the national government? Well, I think that the point is, as you said, is we are dependent on national government for that that sort of national energy policy. So what we can do is is really um, our strategy has really been focusing on on um, energy efficiency as being, you know, the first fuel about how do we yeah, I, really lower the demand? Sorry? Yeah, no, I was just saying, so on the demand side of that equation, That's yeah. Right. Yeah, so to make sure that, um, uh, that we deliver energy efficiency first and then in conjunction with, uh, you know, at the same time trying to move to that low energy um, heating supply, either through through sort of networks, heating networks or, or individual heat pumps. You know, we've looked at hydrogen, but um, we really can't wait for a decarbonized hydrogen to become available. Um, and, you know, we're really focusing what the solutions are that we have now, because we know and, and you know, we already knew anyway that early action was necessary. Um, but even more important that, that, that we get on with it now. Um, and, and I think we've calculated that, you know, a five year delay um, in, in taking action, you know, whilst waiting for hydrogen to become more viable um, would lead to a massive increase in our emissions. So we, we just don't want to, to do that. But we do see, you know, there is a role for hydrogen um, for, for heavy industries, you know, and heavy transport. And so we've been um, looking at this as a sort of portfolio approach. We have um, for example, Transport for London has been investing. Um, we were the first, I think, to pilot um, hydrogen buses um, and the old sort of single decker RV1 that used to run around London, these sort of tourist routes. Um, we have now um, another 20 buses coming on online. And we, I think we helped pilot the first double decker hydrogen bus. Um, so we see the role more for, for heavy industry and shipping and, and things like that. Um, and then focus more on energy efficiency and heat pumps and district heat, heating networks. And one of the big projects that we helped to fund through that um, 10 million pound fund that I mentioned earlier was, was that supersizing of um, some work that boroughs were already doing in North London um, to enable a more, um, more homes, more housing estates to be added to that heat network so that they could access sort of more affordable, uh, competitively affordable um, heat um, at a, at a price that they could, uh, people could afford um and you know i think really it's that no or low regrets option that that, that we that, that we're pursuing really um as i've said we we just don't have the time to to wait for those 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 sort of uh, silver bullets uh, or so-called silver bullets um and and that's that's the approach that we've been taking that's really helpful to hear, Shirley. And um, I want to I want to come back. So I saw a couple of questions come in actually around insulation, the demand side efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. Before I jump to that, 
um, with what you were kind of describing in not waiting again, silver bullet, but at the same time, right, it, the, you can't underestimate the influence of the city of London and UK government and politics, uh, you know, in terms of population, your global financial center, et cetera. So while, you know, I, 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 it was actually quite heartening to hear you say something to the effect that we can't wait five years would mean this. I, I, I very rarely hear people say that and admit to that. And it's the truth. So, uh, you know, kudos to you. But at the same time, while you're getting on with very tangible, practical things, how is how is the mayor of London using the outsized influence of the city to send market signals saying we do need these things? And we it, even if it's five years from now, those to do that, that needs to start happening now. And how are you convincing the market to do that? So let me take um, our zero carbon home standard in the London plan. That that was a big market signal, you know, um, and, and that was about saying to to developers, you know, we have to tackle climate change. The building regulations are insufficient. We have to make sure that the buildings that we're building now um, are, are, are carbon uh, zero carbon, low, low carbon, because we cannot afford to. We have a big enough problem as it is with retrofitting our existing buildings without building more buildings that need to be retrofitted later. And that was a big market signal. And, and we had done a lot of modeling to show that it was um, financially viable to build yeah. a house or build uh, you know in, in a way that could you know could um, meet that sort of ambitious carbon reduction over and above the the national building regulations and we had you know we had we were examined you know by inspectors and and you know through the, there's a very formal process we have to go through here in the UK but um, but over time we've seen that policy come in and over the years we have seen the the reductions in carbon grow over time as builders, I've just realised that is the regulatory framework that's operating in London. We just need to get on with it. And they are innovating and they are showing that, you know, it can be done. And in fact, they've been very supportive of, you know, the extension now to non-domestic um, developments as well. And, you know, this is something that we've been pushing government to do and to reintroduce as part of the, the work that we need to, happen, to see happen across, across the UK. Um, so that market signal is is really important, and I think it's it's something that um, and you remember Nikki Nikki Gavril, the deputy mayor yeah. for for um, environment under under Ken, who always talked about the certainty, you know, long, loud, and clear. It's people want to know there is a level play, playing field, and they know that there's a stable framework and it's um, long term, and they can get on plan. And that's I don't think that has changed, and that's exactly what what people want from. Uh, from government, so the the ten point industrial um, plan that they've talked about, you know, the green industrial revolution, um, sends those signals. What we need to have, though, for that or for air pollution or for for greening or for the nature emergency, is really strong regulation that really then then allows people to get get on and innovate uh, and and do the things that we need <clears throat> need to see. Um, so I'd say, you know. That's really the market signal. The other, the other bit of work that we're doing at the moment, I mentioned um, in my remarks, were um, on electric vehicles, for example. We knew that in rolling out, um, um, you know, for, 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 for making London a zero carbon city by 2050, let alone by 2030, we needed to have very strong um, targets to get people out of their cars and more walking and cycling, the motive target that the mayor has set for 80% of all trips. Now, obviously, this is very challenging in, in an area where uh, we have social distancing and a pandemic and nobody's using our public transport network um, at the moment, but we would hope to see that revert. But in the meantime, the vehicle trips that are out there, we need to be in cleaner vehicles um, and preferably um, electric vehicles. And in understanding what that pathway was, we, we realised we also need to make sure that the charging infrastructure is there um, and we don't we don't have a national policy on this so we went ahead and did it in London so we set a, a sort of a framework of sort of regulations incentives that we have put ahead we commissioned our own research and we did it in a, in a very unique way so it goes to a bit to the the work that the recovery board is doing we brought together an electric vehicle infrastructure task force which had um, you know, the um, vehicle manufacturers, representative organisation, the SMMT, um, businesses, ourselves, Transport for London, local authorities, a whole host of people with an interest on, you know, the UK power network to really understand what was needed to overcome the barriers to roll out uh, of that uh, infrastructure. Um, as I've said, we, we, we represent a quarter of the um, 
EV chargers in, in the country. Um, and just recently, um, ICCT, the sort of independent um, NGO, her, you know, sort of calculated that our network of or our, our framework of policies and regulations was was um, the top city amongst many, including Oslo, which is you know quite surprising given Oslo's performance or, or Norway's performance on, on electric vehicles. But again, it's about sending that market signal and understanding where do we need to be. There's always a role for the public sector uh, to convene. You know, not necessarily to drive. We might need to pump prime, but this is really about how do we now open that out? And the next stage of that that uh, strategy is really about how do we make sure that now the private sector and finance can come in, and what enables that to really um, enable us to ramp up and really keep pace with the change that and the pace of change that we need to see to meet that zero carbon target. What a great example, Shirley! And now, because of what you set up, instead of going to the kind of retrofit question. Uh, maybe the last bit of conversation we had before we turn it back over to, to Robert is um, I think you just laid out a really interesting example of the empower, the importance of the market signal, the, the market signal that the local government needs to send versus that of the national government, the, the long, clear and loud, la- mm-hmm. long, loud and clear. Um, Nikki Gavron, I love that. I forgot about that. Thank you for bringing that up again um, and how those can be, those, those messages can be harmonized. But the, I want to kind of come down to behavior change. You mm-hmm. mentioned, opening remarks, um, which I thought was pretty interesting, the uh, consumption-based emissions in London being three times higher than many cities in the world. Um, we also talked about what the, you know, you, you've been t- spending a lot of time about how to align uh, companies and businesses to do this. Um, so in a way, riffing off of this kind of demand side retrofit question, it is still at the end of the day, individuals. And what made me kind of want to go this direction in your conversation about electric vehicles Um and it was fascinating to see uh, over the last year what happened around transportation. I think there's been a, a large global um, consensus and agreement that we have built uh, our transportation infrastructure, particularly in cities in the northern hemisphere around the world, based on cars instead of people. And that it was a mistake. And it's led to loss economic um productivity, uh, health issues, air quality, et cetera, et cetera. So you're seeing cities around the world try to, to take back their streets and, and to redesign them for what they're intended, which is people, not cars. Uh, and that's not an easy thing, right? Because people, everything is designed to set up around the car at, at the home, at the house, at the work. Uh, so that, that's been met. This issue has been met with resistance for well on a decade. Now, all of a sudden COVID happens. Everybody's in lockdown. And all of a sudden people look out the window and they can see the stars in the city for the first time. They're, they're, they're experiencing what it's like to have a 50, 60, 80% reduction in noise pollution, uh, air quality, it, it, you know, they, they're, they're not getting asthma. And all of a sudden you had this moment where everybody was, oh my gosh, this is what it would look like. I want this. But then of course the realities of COVID came crashing back, you know, in the summer things started letting up, people started traveling again. And then all of a sudden everybody has the opportunity to, to either walk or bike more than they did and or take public transportation. But instead I want to get my hermetically sealed car with the windows up and the AC on because I don't want to, I'm afraid of the virus. And you had this whiplash effect, uh, which is very, so I I want to kind of come back to the behavior change, both in terms of what you said in terms of consumption based emissions, which is individual people's consumption patterns of what they eat, what they buy, where they travel. And then this broader issue of transportation, because I think you can only go, correct me if I'm wrong so far with, local and government leadership and corporate leadership, how are you winning the hearts and the minds of Londoners to adopt these, in some cases, very radical changes from day, for daily life, Shirley? So, so it is about hearts and minds. And, and, and more than anything, I think it's about giving people information um, about, you know, what are the consequences or what are the implications of these choices? Um, and what does um, an alternative look like and you know we've had a very shocking and and you know and, and a way that we really didn't want to have to show what uh, you know a, a, um, a city without uh, lots of cars or a quieter city or a, you know a city with less air pollution would look like this isn't the way that we would want to do it but you can see you know people have seen the benefits and want to have those benefits but maybe not you know obviously not not in the way that that, that, that it's transpired but we've also done a lot of work. So, for example, on um, the the work that we've been doing in London on on the uh, air quality agenda and ultra low emission zone, we've done a lot of work, um, really showing people what the health impacts are um, to people, and really making it 
um, really sort of visible, almost visible, uh, you know, what does that mean from a day to day basis? You know, it's not just, you know, a couple of days off sick, it's long term uh, illnesses, you know, stunted lungs for children, which has an economic cost to the NHS, which we can see is, is you know, falling over, um, uh, you know, at the moment because of the immense pressures that, that, that are being faced by the, by the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, um, but we've had people like, um, you know, NGOs like Mums for Lungs or Client Earth really showing, you know, they don't want kids being, you know, uh, affected by air pollution. We've just had the rest into the death of um, Ella Du Kissy Deborah. Um, you know, it's the first time that air pollution has been recorded on, on any, uh, a death certificate, you know, which is a phenomenal change, which is really showing, you know, so, so making sure people understand what the implications are. But there are pluses, and there are you know you know in in working locally or in, in um, walking and cycling to your shops, it means more people use those local shops. There's an economic benefit to those local shops that people would have just driven and passed in their car to to a big uptown supermarket or something like that. So really understanding, getting that information across, and giving people the choices so that they're able to understand that you know there are sustainability implications and there are alternatives um, and I can't get over how, much, how many people have really taken this agenda on even before the COVID-19 but post-COVID-19 food waste huge huge emissions are associated with our food um, and I was just reading the other day you know record numbers have signed up to to, to trial going vegan for January for January you know half a million people I think it is which is phenomenal wow. you know who'd have thought that you know a year ago or even two years ago there is an there's an underlying um, desire for change and between us all, whether it's boroughs or businesses or the mayor or government, I think it's our responsibility to give people, you know, give people the ability to make those choices. Um, um, uh, and I think people want to do that. So that that's really what our role as leaders should be. Well said, Shirley. Thanks so much. And, and I, I have um, the conversation was too, too um, enriching and I, I went a little past the time we should. So without further ado, I need to turn this back over to Robert to, to bring us home. But Shirley, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure we could have let this uh, run further and I'm sorry to have to draw it to a close, but there it is. Uh, it's been a fascinating hour and we've covered a lot of ground, both from the strategic to the tactical. Um, so on behalf of uh, Resilience First and everybody who's listened, I would like to thank both Shirley and Seth for uh, superb contributions today. Uh, the conversation has flowed easily and I'm very grateful for your time. I'm sure you have other uh, things to do. Um, we will be circulating a short summary in due course. I will do my best to summarise a very interesting conversation. Uh, and it just leaves me to say, please do join us for our next webinar, which is on the 20th of January, when we'll be looking at the implications of Brexit. Another minefield. Thank you very much indeed. Have a lovely day. Bye bye. Thanks, Robert. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Shirley. See you, Seth. Bye, Robert. Thank you. Bye-bye.